Hi everybody, we are Moose, and on today's Yellow Spandex, we're talking about a costume that's as far from fabric as it gets, the symbiote known as Venom. So many eggs for a little time. <gasps> is a superhero suit with a life of its own, a sentient organism with uncontrollable power and a living, breathing fashion statement. With a solo movie on the horizon and crazy new developments in the comics, we thought it was the perfect time to chow down on the evolution of Venom. We start, as always, with the comics and the creation of the classic. Spider-Man's mysterious black suit first appeared in 1984, a few months before its alien origin was revealed in issue 8 of the Secret Wars crossover. We later learn that it's part of an alien species called the Clintar, but all that backstory is secondary compared to how damn cool it looked. The simple, high contrast design came from artists Mike Zeck and Randy Schuler, based on a proposed look for a new Spider-Woman. Originally, red was going to be the secondary color, but even after Zek switched to a black and white scheme, the costume was still pretty far from the slobbering symbiote we know and fear today. Writer David Michelini decided to use it as the basis for a badass new villain and created its most famous host, Eddie Brock. Venom's killer look, on the other hand, came from Spidey artist Todd McFarlane, whose signature style transformed the basic black suit to a hulking monstrosity with a toothy, demonic grin. Here's the funny story. I didn't know that uh, the character was going to be a human inside of it. It actually is a happy accident because if David had given me that information earlier, I'm guaranteeing you I wouldn't have made him as big as he was because I thought he was an alien. I just went in there and thought I could do something super crazy with him. Later artists like Eric Larson introduced Venom's tongue and slathering saliva, and for his first solo series, Mike Bagley came up with Venom's most disgusting evolution yet, Eddie's monstrous mullet. Artists have a lot of leeway when drawing the alien symbiote. It's gooey, there's tentacles, there's drool, there's teeth. You could pretty much draw it however you feel like it. But when Brock is behind the wheel, they mostly keep to the original 80s design, even though the meaning behind it has just changed. This year, we learned that the logo on his chest isn't supposed to be a spider, it's a dragon, representing the ancient avatar of Null, god of the symbiotes. Eddie has been rocking some brand new wings as a result, but it's still more or less the same as Zek and McFarlane's classic design. Brock has experimented with alternate looks, like his brief run as the inverted anti-venom and his gooey purple Ultimate Universe counterpart. But the biggest changes usually come when someone else succumbs to the symbiote. In the 34 years since its debut, Venom has attached itself to dozens of different characters. Honestly, if you name a popular Marvel hero, odds are they've tried Venom on for size at some point, especially if you count what ifs and alternate universes. But only four individuals have worn the suit long enough to be considered main Venoms. So let's look at the hosts with the most. Eddie Brock remained Venom for nearly 20 years, but in 2004, the symbiote found two new hosts, courtesy of writer Mark Millar. A cancer-stricken Eddie becomes a born-again Christian after seeing the passion because, again, 2004, and to atone for his evil deeds, he sells the symbiote at a black market auction and donates the profits to charity. The highest bidder is a mob boss who buys it for his wimpy son, Angelo Fortunato, a name which, by the way, translates to Fortunate Angel, which you will see the irony of in like 30 seconds. Angelo took to the suit quickly and tricked it out with a new design that dialed back some of the 90s excess. Instead of those big, blank, stylized eyes, the white markings on Venom's head, they kind of became more like face paint, and his new chest symbol had thicker, angular lines that extended up to his arms. Sometimes. Unfortunately for Angelo, his new best friend wasn't impressed by his cowardice and abandons him in midair to fall to a grisly and horrible death. Fortunate Angel, indeed. The symbiote settled on McDonald Mac Gargan, AKA the Scorpion, one of Spidey's oldest and least respected supervillains. You're nothing but a two bit, no account, second rate sewer breath baboon with the brain of a pigeon and the face of an eel. Stop it! <laughs> Bonded by their mutual hatred of the wall crawler, Gargan kept the new look, although he eventually incorporated his trademark scorpion stinger. As Venom, Gargan was thrilled to have finally made it to the A-list of supervillains. And as an imposter Spider-Man, he relished in tarnishing the name of his hated foe. But as the symbiote set its hooks in, it forced Gargan into unthinkable acts of carnage and cannibalism, driving him even more insane. The authorities separate him from the symbiote and hand it to a more controllable candidate, Eugene Flash Thompson. 
I've always wanted to be the hero. Now, I booked the part. Now, ordinarily, you'd think Peter Parker's biggest bully bonding with the symbiote would be Spider-Man's worst nightmare. But Flash had grown up a lot since his time in Midtown High, and after losing both legs during his army service in Iraq, the government selected him as the perfect host for their symbiotic super soldier, Agent Venom. Instead of looking like skin-tight spandex or gelatinous goo, Flash's costume took the shape of tactical armor, sort of like Kevlar crossed with a spiky insect exoskeleton. And overall, it was an awesome new take on the character, a lethal protector for the Call of Duty era. But I do question the need for all those straps and pouches. You're wearing a living suit that can basically do anything. Why would you need a pouch when you could just put things in yourself? Flash tried out a bulkier new design when he was adventuring in space, but his run as Venom came to an end as the symbiote found a new host, a former army ranger turned mob henchman named Lee Price, who offered a unique twist to the character. Now, normally it's the influence of the symbiote that causes the host to kill, but the alien actually kind of enjoyed its time as a hero and it wanted to keep those good vibes going. Unfortunately for the suit, Lee was already a ruthless killer and his will dominated the symbiotes, manifesting in an edgelord trench coat and a monstrous form that looked like a cross between Doomsday and a skeleton Halloween costume. Price didn't last long as Venom and honestly, it's probably for the best. For most fans, Eddie Brock is the definitive host, especially after decades of seeing him on screen. Now, we're not gonna cover video games here since I've already done a four-part history of Spidey games, so we're gonna start with Venom's first TV appearance in Spider-Man the Animated Series. This 1994 show made a huge impact on young Spidey fans and helped cement Venom as the Web Slinger's most popular new baddie, thanks to an unforgettable voice provided by Simpsons legend Hank Azaria. As Eddie, his New York accent is a little over the top. My apartment? And I could definitely hear a little mo in there. You can't do this! Wow, that was an antique. Crap! But the intense voice he used as Venom. You've gotta separate from it! Separate! We're made for each other! Scared the crap out of kids everywhere. Ah! Okay, bye. Since the 90s series, Venom has popped up in pretty much every animated adaptation, usually wearing a variant of the original design. Although the Ultimate Spider-Man series had basically everyone except Eddie wear the symbiote for a minute, from Harry Osborn to Kraven the Hunter. Later seasons would also introduce Flash as Agent Venom, but Brock came back after Ultimate was replaced by a new Spidey series. As for the big screen, there had been plans to push Venom as a solo star since the early 2000s, but he didn't make his debut until 2007's Spider-Man 3. This movie was a disappointment in about a million ways, but the most glaring for me, at least visually, was the design of the symbiote. They took one look at the most striking, innovative, and modern superhero designs maybe ever and said, nah, let's just dye that regular Spidey suit black. I guess they wanted to show Venom as a twisted, mangled mirror of Spider-Man, and they used the webbing motif to illustrate the symbiote's strangling grip on Spidey. I was hoping it would look a little cooler once it found its proper host, but even with Topher Grace's surprisingly decent performance, Venom could not have been more lame. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> He was barely more jacked than Tobey Maguire. His tentacles looked like a bad Winamp visualization. And he was constantly pulling back his face to reveal a very unintimidating Eric Foreman with vampire fangs. We never got a chance to see Venom in the amazing reboots, which brings us to the latest incarnation of the lethal protector, Tom Mother and Hardy. Oh, I have a parasite. Yeah. Name is Chen. And while I still can't quite see this version of Venom interacting with little baby Tom Holland, I'm definitely impressed by the design. Modern CGI has given us a massive, jacked up symbiote that finally looks as alien as its origin. Its glistening texture and oozing tentacles reminds me of artist Clayton Crane's extra gooey portrayal. And while I'm disappointed with the lack of the symbol, the sickly white veins are a pretty decent compromise. Even Todd McFarlane seems pleased with it, although he's got a few minor tweaks of his own. People keep asking me, Todd, what do you think of it? I think it looks pretty cool in most of the spots there, So, but I would just do some little Toddy tweaks if my name wasn't Todd, it was God. I can see where he's coming from, but that's sort of the beauty behind Venom. Every artist can approach him in a completely different way because the design is so brilliantly simple. 
The symbiote has become permanently bonded to all of comic fandom. While the verdict is still out on the Solo movie, we're keeping an open mind. We will eat your face right off your head. You will be this armless, legless, faceless thing, won't you? Rolling down the street like a bird in the wind. Thanks for watching everybody, and thanks to those of you who voted in our Yellow Spandex poll. Now I want to know what you guys think of the upcoming Venom movie. Does it look any good? Is this really necessary? Can Tom Hardy and Tom Holland exist in the same cinematic universe? Leave a comment, let me know, and as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.